Good morning. Welcome to worship. We're so glad that you are here. Our theme this morning is that God sees, that God watches over us. So I'd like to just invite you as we begin our worship this morning to just get comfortable where you are, perhaps close your eyes for just a moment and imagine the watchful, loving, caring gaze of God upon you this morning. God is watching over you in these very moments. With that in mind, let us prepare our hearts for worship.
Good morning. Will you please stand as you are able and join with me in our call to worship, followed by our opening hymn. And then our affirmation of faith today will be led by one of our confirmation students, Sophie. Join with me in our call to worship. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us. The Spirit of the Lord is in us, anointing us and sending us out to bring good news, to release and to heal, to liberate and to proclaim favor. The day of the Lord is coming. The day of the Lord has come. Let us sing together our opening hymn, O Worship the King. Methodist social affirmation. We believe in God, creator of the world and of all people, and in Jesus Christ, incarnate among us, who died and rose again, and in the Holy Spirit, present with us to guide, strengthen, and comfort. We believe in God, help our belief. We rejoice in every sign of God's kingdom, in the upholding of human dignity and community 
in every expression of love, justice, and reconciliation, in each act of self-giving on behalf of others, in the abundance of God's gifts entrusted to us that all may have enough, in all responsible use of the earth's resources. We confess our sin, individual and collective, by silence or action, through the violation of human dignity based on race, based on race, class, age, sex, nation, or faith, through the exploitation of people because of greed and indifference, through the misuse of power in personal, communal, national, and international life, through the search for security by those military and economic forces that threaten human existence through the abuse of technology, which endangers the earth and all life among it, upon it. We commit ourselves individually and as a community to the way of Christ, to take up the cross, to seek abundant life for all humanity, to struggle for peace with justice and freedom, to risk ourselves in faith, hope, and love, praying that God's kingdom may come. Amen.
everyone. It is so good to see all of you this morning. I hope that you grabbed a bulletin on your way in. In those bulletins are our Connect cards. Um, please fill them out and drop them into the offering plate as we collect our offering. Unless you're new, if this is your first time worshiping with us, we're so glad that you're here. Please hang on to your Connect card. And as you leave church, out of these doors over yonder, there's a welcome table. And uh, we have a gift for you, and we'd like to get to know you. I have a few announcements this morning, and I hope that you'll forgive me. I'd like to briefly sermonize. I can't help myself. Uh, there are a lot of claims about what a church is or what a church should be. And I'm not here to... Uh, say a church is this or that, but I'm going to um, give a thesis of, of, I think, church at its best. And church at its best is a worshiping community that does meet on Sundays. We care for our souls together in hopes that we can care for the world. It is through the care of our souls that we witness to something that Dr. King popularized, which is beloved community. And when we witness to beloved community, we're witnessing to a community that is marked by forgiveness and mercy and grace and justice. And one of the ways the church can embody that witness to beloved community is to get connected to organizations that are doing very good work in the Orlando community. So this morning, we have a very special opportunity. We have our nonprofit information fair. There are organizations that are in the atrium that are doing incredible work in the Orlando community. They've made time to meet with all of you so that you can learn about the, the work that they do. I'm going to um, tell you which organizations are here and hopefully there's a representative of those organizations who's gonna stand so you can put an organizational name to a face. Um, and please hold your applause until after I've mentioned all of these organizations, because otherwise this would already go on for as long as it already has, right? Okay, so the organizations that are in the atrium right now are iDignity, Bethany Christian Services, Chef Crystal, we have Circles, and Family Promise, the Christian Service Center, the Coalition for the Homeless, and United Against Poverty. Can we give a, a round of applause for these folks? So please, if you have not already made time to visit with those organizations, at the end of service today, carve out an extra 30 minutes of your Sunday, go to the atrium and visit with those organizations. You might find a group of people that really resonates with you. Sound good? Okay. This Saturday, this coming Saturday from 10 to noon, we have our Literacy Day. I don't know if you've noticed, we've got a very large collection of books that we spent all day Wednesday organizing. And we're going to be giving away those books for free. So if you want free books, and some of them are very good. I, I exercised some self-constraint and didn't steal them already from you. So there are good books. Come, you get them for free. We will have reading. We will have child care. And there's also an opportunity as you're leaving church today, there are poster boards outside. And on those poster boards are bookmarks. And on those bookmarks, are you still following me? And on those bookmarks are books that we would like to purchase for schools. These are brand new books that we'd like to give to school libraries. So please, if you would like, grab a bookmark and buy the book that's recommended on that bookmark so we can continue to support our community. And finally, we have new First Church Serve shirts. They are very cool t-shirts um, and they will be available for purchase beginning this Tuesday. Um, every day of the week, uh, typically Monday through Friday, but we have off on Monday for President's Day. Uh, so those will also be available per to, for purchase for upcoming Sundays. All right? Okay.
Good morning. I need to tell you I've also shown great restraint. I haven't taken any books, but I know where they are, and I'm first in line on Saturday, so uh, <laughs> I hope you'll come. Let us be in a spirit of prayer together. In the words of the psalmist, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord rescues them from them all. O Lord God, as we gather in this place to worship today, we sense your presence here with us. You say that when two or more gathered in your name, you are there. And we recall today that you are a God that watches over us. We remember the Egyptian slave, Hagar, who named you El Roy, the God who sees. We recall how you saw and heard the cries as the Israelite slaves were abused in Egypt and you sent a deliverer to rescue them. We remember how you watched over them over those years in the wilderness. We recall how you saw the repentance of the Ninevites in the days of Jonah and relented from your plans of destruction. As the psalmist says, truly the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love. And so, God, we pray and we find comfort in your loving gaze, knowing that you are watching over us as a loving mother watches over her child as a protective shepherd watches over his flock, as a night guard watches over a sleeping city. You see into our hearts. You know our motives, our intentions, our desires, our hopes, our dreams. You know us and understand us better than we know ourselves. We know that nothing escapes your attention, every good deed, every evil intent. Not even a single sparrow falls from the sky without your notice. We know this. We know that you watch over us, even now. And yet we confess, O God, that we often act as though you must be blind and ignorant to our ways. Sometimes we hope that your eyes are closed or your head is turned when we fail to live as you call us to be. Sometimes we hide from you in our shame. And perhaps sometimes we just don't care. We confess that sometimes we grow impatient with your watching. We wait and watch in hopeful expectation, waiting for you to do something. We wonder how you can see what is happening and not intervene sooner. We confess, O God, that we don't see as you see, that far too often we're blind to the needs and opportunities all around us. So forgive us, Lord, we pray. Remind us that your ways are not our ways, your wisdom is not our wisdom, and your timing is not our timing. And that often you are working in ways that we cannot even begin to imagine. Restore our faith in your watchful eye. Lord, we pray this morning that you would watch over our world, and we know that you are, even as we continue to wrestle with the pandemic. We pray that you watch over the peoples of Russia and Ukraine and everywhere there is threat and potential of war. Watch over the innocent and the vulnerable especially. We pray that you watch over those in our community who struggle with inadequate housing, inadequate income, inadequate food. We pray that you watch over those who are victims of injustice. And watch over us here and now as we worship you this morning, O God. May you see in us your loving children, your faithful disciples, true worshipers in spirit and in truth. May you see in us your own image and likeness, reflections of your glory among us and within us. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who saw especially the hurting and the broken among us. And we pray in his name, our Father, who art among us, be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I'd like to just take a moment uh, to introduce to you our guest preacher today. So good news, first of all, that we have a guest preacher, not the usual guy. Our preacher this morning is Reverend Brian Pustlewaite, who is the Chief Operating Officer of the Homeless Services Network of Central Florida, who we, since uh, about a year ago, have been uh, housing here and sharing space with here at First Church Orlando. Uh, Brian is a graduate and has degrees from Point Loma Nazarene University and Nazarene Theological Seminary. He is an ordained pastor in the Nazarene Church. Uh, a little bit closer to home, uh, Pastor Brian is the spouse of Pastor Becky, our own children's director. So we got a twofer when we invited Becky to join our staff. And when I told her that I was going to invite Brian to preach, she said, he's an awesome preacher. I thought maybe she was biased, but then I heard him at 930. He really is an awesome preacher. Uh, and in addition, uh, Brian is the father of two Boone Braves, uh, Madeline and Will, who are with us this morning. Uh, he, we have a few more moments in the service before uh, Brian comes to preach, but would you join me now in welcoming Brian as our preacher today? And one more piece of good news, it's time for the offering, and so we invite the ushers to come as we present our tithes and offerings.
Lord, we are so thankful for all the many ways you pour out blessings upon us. You are such a generous God. We return to you now a portion of all that you have given us. We pray that you bless it, multiply it, use it for the good work of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you're having a seat, you can take your hymnal and let's sing number 349 together in preparation of our message today. I can attest to the fact that you're about to hear a really good sermon. morning. Um, really amazing to be with you and what a unique honor uh, for me to be here. Uh, I have been wandering around your uh, facility for about two years now. Uh, you didn't know it. Uh, scoping it out as a new home for the Homeless Services Network and with lots of planning and lots of conversation, you know, the, all of the I's dotted and T's crossed. We are now uh, roommates, and it is a beautiful, beautiful thing. I, I, I know a little bit about running around the church, and I know that when you're around for a while, you sometimes notice the cracks in the plaster and the leaky roof and maybe the stains in the carpet start to show up a little bit more. But for somebody who is new to this place, let me just say what a wonderful community. And we are delighted to be uh, with you and my family as well. And uh, uh, Becky is just filled with so much joy to be a children's pastor here and um, every day we're giving thanks to God who provides uh, for us and, and uh, so thank you for being here. I, I, I love how Cam, um, Cam is a way of words, right? So he's a man of words and I love how he says, I hope that you will tolerate my sermonizing. So I hope that you will tolerate my sermonizing as well. If I say the word snap, what immediately comes to mind? Snap peas, snap dragons, snap your fingers to the beat. One of my favorite urban sayings of late, oh snap! But if you're under the age of 18, or uh, you have children under the age of 18, or you're one of those very hip moms out there, when I said snap, you had the temptation to grab your phone and check in on your streaks and make sure your peeps uh, all know where you're at. 
My children are cringing right now. Dad doesn't know what Snapchat is. I don't. I admit I know nothing about it. But it seems to me that uh, when you get the snap and you're taking your selfies and you're sending them all about, it's all about being seen. Because being seen in our culture is an obsession, right? And I'm not saying it's a good or it's a bad thing. It just is a true thing that people want to be seen. And let's be honest, to different degrees, we all crave to be seen, to be noticed, to be appreciated and valued and connected. And social media is built on, capitalizes on that desire to be seen and to be noticed. You put up a Facebook post and you see how many likes that you got. Or you have an Instagram uh, picture and you see how many hearts you have. You uh, uh, go to YouTube and post a video and see how many views you got it. If you're really hip, you're on TikTok and you see how many notices you got on there too. I remember when I was a, a, a kid, I was about four years old, so this would have been in 1977. Now, that will give you my age, approximately. And I don't know if you know, I remember in the 70s, and, and uh, Nike started making uh, sneakers, and I had this new pair of blue Nikes with the waffle bottoms, you know what I'm talking about? Man, they were so beautiful, and I, my mom purchased them probably on layaway, and some of you don't even know what layaway is. And so then I put them on, I could not wait for my father to get home because as soon as he came to the door, I met him there, I said, Dad, look at my new sneakers. And I immediately started running laps around the front yard to see how fast the sneakers made me because I wanted to be noticed. I wanted to be seen like the Little League baseball player that gets a hit and stands on first base and looks back up into the stands to see his parents gazing with a, approval. Or young lovers at the park looking at in, into each other's eyes. Or that new high school graduate that crosses the stage and grabs a diploma and then looks up into the sea of people to try to make out their parents proud standing there, clapping, smiling. And, oh, babies, right? Babies love to gaze into the eyes of their most familiar adults. I was at Theology on Tap on Thursday night, which uh, Cam happily leads, and I think happily. It's beautiful. It's at, it's at the Gatlin Brewing House, and, and really have had a tremendous opportunity meeting people in that space. But this week, you never know if it's going to be crowded or kind of mild. This week, it was packed. The house, it was loud. The music was loud. The people were everywhere. And there was, in the middle of all this craziness, a father with a child. Did you see this? And this father was just cradling that child and looking into the child's eyes. The child was looking and cooing back, even amidst all of the distraction. And it reminded me of that scene in the Gospels where Mary and Jesus are in the upper room with the disciples, and Martha is milling about the room, trying to keep everybody, all the glasses filled, and the disciples are grumbling because they have an agenda. But there was Mary, and there was Jesus, and Mary adorned Jesus' feet, a mix of oil and hair and tears. Mary gazing right into the eyes of Jesus. Jesus gazing back with loving approval. Being seen makes a difference. Being seen by our beloved, wow! That transforms. Now, conversely, 
not being seen often elicits within us feelings of insecurity and anxiety, maybe loneliness, and sometimes even abuse or torture. Babies need eye contact from very, when they're immediately born, is that right? We know that the, the, the neural pathways in their brains are beginning to sew themselves together as we connect with them eyes to eye. There is a quest of intimacy that seems to be at the very core of human flourishing that begins in the simple yet authentic act of being seen. Now I'm going to read to you Acts chapter 3 this morning and this scene is uh, a very familiar passage in the Gospels but this is where stuff really starts to pick up speed. We find speaking of being seen or seeing, let me put there. Beginning in Acts chapter 3 and I want you to listen to where this vision of being seen really happens. Peter and John were going up to the temple at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the established prayer time. Meanwhile, a man crippled since birth was being carried in. Every day, people would place him at the temple gate, known as the beautiful gate, so that he could be there and ask for money as people entered the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he began to ask them for a gift. Peter and John stared at him. Peter said, look at us. So the man gazed at them, expecting to receive something from them. And Peter said, I don't have any money, but, what I, but I will give you what I do have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the, the Nazarene, rise up and walk. And then he grasped the man's right hand and raised him up. And once his feet and ankles became strong at once, Jumping up, he began to walk around. He entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. They recognized him as the same one who used to sit at the temple, temple's beautiful gate asking for money. They were filled with amazement and surprise at what had happened to him. This is the word of the Lord. Did you catch that? That transformational moment where Peter and John's eyes met the eyes of the beggar outside the, the temple beautiful and immediately his feet became strong and he leapt through those temple gates dancing and praising God. Now just a little background. Why would this man, this beggar, this crippled man, this disabled man, be on the outside of the temple gates. Well, if you know anything about these Near Eastern culture, that ancient Near Eastern culture, when people were disabled or different, they were seen as sinful. They were seen as unclean. And so they weren't allowed in the temple. One of my closest friends, who's a Roman Catholic, faithfully attends Mass every week, and I'm always fond of hearing him say, yes, I go to Mass on Sundays to look at the good God and allow the good God to look at me. The man outside the temple gate could not look at the good God. He could not go into the temple. He could not let the good God look at him. And the real problem for the beggar sitting outside the gate, beautiful, is a problem of access. You see, the temple was the place, was the site of healing. He needed to be healed, but, but he was unable to go through the gate to get healed. And so how interesting, how wonderful it was Peter and John there, he's sitting outside and they... Heal him there. 
that it was a problem of access. He couldn't get to the place of healing. I grew up in Kansas City and was a part of a beautiful congregation that this one reminds me so much of the congregation of my, my childhood. And there was an usher, the head usher of that church. His name was Dale Harris. And uh, Dale was the first person you saw when you came into the building every Sunday morning. Uh, Dale just passed away this last week at the age of 94. Had a long career as a Ford uh, executive. Um, had his own story of redemption. He was part of gangs as a young child. And then my whole childhood, him, I, know, I knew him as the greeter. And I remember every morning, and even as a young man, I would climb the stairs up to the sanctuary. And before I could get up to the top of the stairs, there was Dale, big as life and big hands. And he would reach down to a couple stairs, and he would wrap his big hands around my tiny hands. And he would pull me up the last couple stairs. And there would be a hug and an embrace and maybe some shadow boxing and some tickling, I don't know, whatever else, but what he said, his whole countenance about him was, you are seen. You belong here. And as I thought about Dale this week, I was filled with this tremendous sense of gratitude for that church, for that community. That, that welcomed me into that place, that made a space for me, made a space for me in the children's department, in the nursery, and, and then as I grew, a, a space for me in the, uh, at children's camp, and I was in musicals, and, and, and I was allowed at the altar, and, and I read in Scripture as beautifully as we heard today, and, and then eventually... I went to college at a Nazarene college and, and seminary. I got my first job outside of working for my dad in the church. I pastored and then was a part of, of many social ministries in the life of the church. And now I'm here working at HSN. The people of God and the, and the, the community of Jesus made space for me. And I was born with uh, slow-growing tumors in my face that have made me, made me at the time a very unusual kid. I think I'm probably a very unusual-looking adult now. And I experienced everything you can imagine that just comes with being different and being unusual in our culture. But you don't need to have a facial difference or a disability or even to be a visible minority to understand the predicament of not being seen. And how that exclusion creates feelings of insecurity and anxiety and loneliness and sometimes neglect that can even create heartache and trauma. And for some of us, that means being cut off from the place of healing. That healing space where you're seen, where you're known, that space, that spot that we talked about between Mary and Jesus where there's Jesus and Mary lounging at Jesus, a mix of oil and hair and tears where it is radical acceptance, a space where everything is understood in its proper context. Your, your whole life story, the the beauty and the pain, the triumph and the tragedy, the love and the disappointment. And truth be told, as much as we thirst for that kind of place, we sometimes also, as Vance mentioned in his prayer, tragically deny ourselves the opportunity to be seen, right? The Little League baseball player who muffs the play and doesn't look up to see his parents but looks down and turns away because of disappointment. Like a wounded animal, we oftentimes retreat to our solace to lick our wounds. 
Those of us who struggle with melancholy or depression oftentimes seek a place where we're unable to ask for help. We're experiencing too much alienation to reach and to be open. And cut off from ourselves, cutting off ourselves from a place of healing and also being cut off from that place of healing. And what we need is home. It's that simple, that simple word. It's more than a roof over your head. It's that safe place where you can recuperate and heal. And that's what people experiencing homelessness need more than anything else. They need access to the place of healing. And for most of them, it does start with a roof over their head, a door that they can lock, a place where they can keep their private belongings, a, a, a place where they can sleep without fear of getting woken up unexpectedly or beat up or just in a cozy spot away from the cold. There's so many amazing, or let me say it's, it's my pleasure to serve the homeless service with the Homeless Services Network and, and we're really grateful to join you in the mission, but I want to highlight the great organizations that are here today. The Coalition for the Homeless and Bethany and the Christian Service Center, iDignity and others, I'm, I know I'm forgetting some of them. HSN doesn't actually provide direct services. Um, we work quietly behind the scenes to make sure that resources flow in an effective and efficient manner. We, we analyze data to make sure that we can make improvements in the system. We facilitate planning and, and try to knock down the silos and create opportunities for collaboration. We, and we, uh, because there aren't enough resources in our community to serve everybody experiencing homelessness, we, we try to help create policies to serve those that are most in need of help. Uh, you remember the recent uh, cold snap? There's that snap word again. Um, for three days. It's the coldest, I've only been in Florida for five years. It's the coldest three days I've ever experienced in Florida. And uh, HSN was at work trying to pull together all the partners necessary to ensure that we as a community could say that anybody that wanted to come inside during those three cold days could do so. And so I ended up at the Coalition of the Homeless on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night just observing what was going on. And on Friday night, there was a a crush of people, about 150 uh, persons that were, that were unhoused, that were there hoping to get to a warming center or into the shelter so that they were not out on a freezing night. And I ran into a, a gentleman, uh, I want to call him Mr. D. And Mr. D was so excited to see me. Um, he started telling me this story, talking really fast about how he had identified a place to live and how he was about to sign a lease on Tuesday. In the meantime, he was going to board a Lynx bus to go to one of the warming centers. And Mr. D has been homeless for four years. He has a mental health condition and is disabled. And, and he had been working with his outreach uh, worker. His name's Brad. Some of you may know Brad. And, and Brad had helped him uh, begin to put the pieces together to get ready to, to find housing. And, and he worked with iDignity to make sure he had his, all his documents in order and his disability uh, payments reconnected. And then he had um, a case manager that he got through uh, the Christian Service Center who was beginning to put everything in place for him to get into a place to live. 
And then he worked with HSN. HSN uh, promised that we would pay for his rent once he got a place. And, and we had a team of people go out and look for a place for him to live. And once we found one, and he, he came and he looked at it. He said, this is wonderful. I want to live here. Then uh, we helped him sign a lease and in, inspect the unit and make sure it was, it was safe. And then HSN will faithfully pay the portion of his, a portion of his rent for as long as he needs to help, help to maintain a roof over his head. And as much as I know that we're working daily to ensure people experiencing homelessness have that access to this place of healing, we at the Homeless Services Network here in this building are kind of at arm's length. These orga great organizations, they're serving people directly. And so it's so hard, it's so easy to forget and to not connect and to not see people where they're at and forget. And I was so grateful for that story. You can't see it, but I've got a picture of Mr. D right here. We snapped a selfie together. Reminded to look at people, to see people as a way to give them access to the place of healing that they need. I'm so captured by this scripture. Everything seems to, to move on this action of seeing the beggar. The next thing you know, 5,000 people are added to the number of those uh, following Jesus. Immediately after 5,000 people start following Jesus, Peter and John are thrown into jail. And, and so everything starts to snowball after they see the beggar. Why did Peter and John see the beggar? That's the question that I keep asking myself this week. And even as somebody who works on a daily basis serving people experiencing homelessness, I struggle to connect with people who are unhoused on the street. Maybe you do as well. You probably maybe came to a church this morning and passed somebody who may be panhandling or maybe on the streets or may have been on a bench. And what is that interaction? Do you look? Do you see? Somebody's in need? It's hard. It's, it's hard to know what to do. There's a risk. There's a, there's a investment of time. There's, um, it's a challenge. If there's things that are unknown, we have busy lives. How do we help? And it's difficult for us when we're suffering and in pain also. How are we to be seen? And yet in Acts, this simple act of seeing was the very fulcrum of transformation for the beggar and for Peter and John and for that infant community of Jesus. The only thing that I can think of like Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus Peter and John had been so transformed by seeing Jesus the Christ that they began to see others in a new way as well And maybe perhaps it's like, as Pastor Vance said last week, when we think of the admonition in, in Hebrews to not neglect to show hospitality for, to strangers, for some have welcomed angels without knowing it. Or those disciples that walked along the road to Emmaus as they talked about all that was happening in Jerusalem and shared a meal and Jesus appeared to them. The early Christians, they used to walk uh, in Rome and pick up uh, people that were deceased in the gutters 
believing that in serving those who had already died, they were serving Christ himself. Mother Teresa always talks about meeting Christ in the distressed disguise of the poor. Vance Raines talked last week about meeting a tormenting angel in a man who had a log that was carrying a log that was bigger than himself. As beautiful as a home is, as wonderful as a welcoming and affirming community is, the real place of healing is the gaze that we receive from a self-giving God. The simple and radical act of looking at the good God and allowing the good God to look back at us. This God whom Peter and John came to know through Jesus Christ, the same Christ that gazes upon us through the work of the Holy Spirit, points us to live into the way of Jesus. It really is such an audacious claim for us as people who call ourselves Christians that this Christ is the very wisdom and logic of the universe connected to an obscure and homeless rabbi 2,000 years ago who was born in the midst of straw and manure and poverty a refugee, no less, who lived in a neighborhood on the wrong side of the tracks. Lived and died and rose again from the dead. And we are invited to gaze upon this Christ because he first saw us. I'm not sure how you have experienced that or how you may need to experience that now. How do you need to access that place of healing? Maybe it's in service. Maybe it's in finding an organization to connect with where you can meet Christ in the distressed disguise of the poor. Perhaps it is welcoming the stranger to a meal where the guest becomes the host and the host becomes the guest and you're all of a sudden off to a divine dance of reciprocity and mutuality. Maybe it's that you just need to go into nature and see the beauty of God's creation. Maybe you just need silence or just to be here in this place of worship for a moment of contemplation. We all connect with the one who sees us differently. Whatever the connecting point that you're most tuned into, the good news is you are seen by the one who can make all things new. Amen. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the join me in thanking Pastor Brian. Let us stand, let's sing our closing hymn, Be Thou My Vision, number 451.
are so thankful that all of you are here for worship today, especially if you're visiting. If you're a guest, we hope that you'll take a moment to go to the welcome table. There's a gift waiting there for you. Now, as we close, uh, let's say to one another our benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may the love of God, the grace and mercy and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.